I'm Cecil Schwabe. I'm a uh, herpetologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, I'm here at the BioBlitz with some of my creatures that uh, that the public can can see. Some of them they can even touch. We've got some non-venomous snakes and desert tortoises that uh, the kids are touching here, and after they touch them, we we give them uh, some cleanser to wash up. And one of the more popular items here was the Gila monster, and they can't touch it, of course, because it's a venomous lizard. But it, uh, it's, uh, it's it made the kids have really just overwhelmed this corner at times today. Oh, I've seen that. Let's walk over to the Gila monster, and then you can tell us a little bit more about it. Okay. Now this is native to the Saguaro National Park, is it? Yeah. All the animals I brought today occur on Saguaro National Park, either east or west. And I did that on purpose, just because the kids are here and we're all trying to see the things. And there, there's such a great diversity of all kinds of plants and animals here. Saguaro National Park, I think, is a great place for one of the Violet's parks. The Gila Monster is one of only two venomous lizards in the world. And the other one is its larger cousin, the Mexican beaded lizard. But these are here in fair numbers. There's actually a Gila Monster study project that's being carried on in Suara right now that Dr. Kevin Bonine, a colleague of mine, is, is doing. And they're putting radio transmitters, they're surgically implanting radio transmitters in them so that they can follow them and learn where they lay their eggs, where they uh, where they go looking for food. It's interesting, only in, in the last decade have we actually found where he the monsters lay their eggs. We've never known because they, they're they excellent diggers and so they, they dig down and bury them. Uh, they had an experiment in New Mexico where they were hooked up with a veterinarian that were going to implant a radio transmitter in the oviduct and so then when the Gila monster laid the eggs in the nest, they could track it and find the nest. But when they started doing the surgery, they found out the Gila monster, the female Gila monster they had, she really wasn't pregnant, she was just very well fed. So <laughs> that's why only now there's a group in uh, at Arizona State University that is uh, honing in on some de desert, uh, some Gila monster nests. Now the purpose of the venom of the Gila monster is to kill the prey before they eat it, is that right? Like a snake? Actually, that uh, that's what an uh, assumption a lot of people make, but most of us working with Gila monsters believe the Gila monster venom is a defensive venom. It's very much pain inducing, uh, but there's no tissue necrotic properties, like the rattlesnake bite is very ugly because it starts to di digest in your tissue and uh, it really just makes a lot of lo local tissue damage. Gila monsters bites are very painful, but no necrosis, and uh, there's no uh, anticoagulants in their venom, but they bleed very profu uh, profusely because their teeth are so sharp, they're like razor blades. If you cut your finger with a scalpel or a razor blade, it bleeds much more than with a pocket knife. Right. And that's because the pocket knife is duller and collapses the capillary walls. So these are, it's very interesting because uh, very few animals in the wild prey on adult Gila monsters. So it's a defense mechanism. It's uh, a, predators it's, it's know, a, leave this alone. And. Uh, once, once an animal has been bitten by one, they don't want to mess with it. But right. the, the pain is, is, is real. It doesn't look like something I would want to pick up anyway, even without knowing that it was uh, venomous. Well, it's, uh, it, this, uh, these animals are very placid. But I've had this animal since 1986. And uh, so it's gotten very used to me and being handled. But a wild Gila monster, when it's hot and you try and pick it up, it will hiss at you, it will arch its mouth. And uh, it's a very, uh, it sends its message very clearly that it doesn't want to be messed with. Right. So tell us a little bit about the tortoises over here. It, these are two Sonoran Desert tortoises, and uh, these are actually, the uh, larger one is 10 years old. These both hatched from uh, a pair in my yard, and the larger one is 10 years old, the smaller one is 5 years old, and you can actually age them 
by counting the growth rings around each of these central scoots. And there are roughly each growth ring represents a year of growth. And, and you'll see on this one, you're, it's coming into its fifth year, and this one is about 10. And it, uh, you can only use this method for about 20 some odd years, and then the growth is so slight you can't tell them apart. Now, how does a tortoise uh, survive in a hot desert? Do you think they cook inside that shell? Uh, well, it's, it's called the desert tortoise because it, it's adapted well, and it's done a great job of selecting habitats where it can get out of the extreme heat during the day. So during during the summer rains, these things will be active in the early morning hours and the late afternoon hours, but the middle parts of the day they're usually holed up in holes in the rocks. They very interestingly, in the months of May and June here before the summer rains start, these animals will not defecate or urinate because they can't afford the water loss. They'll hold it all in and they're able to let their their body fluids reach higher concentrations than we could. We would get dizzy and, and have all kinds of physiological difficulties, but they're able to hold that in until the rains come. They come out and drink, and 24 hours later, then they clear out the system. They defecate and urinate, and then they brought their uh, a new equilibrium to their water balance. Amazing animals. Are they doing okay, or are they endangered? Are they, are they all right? Well, if, this is formerly was thought to be a subspecies of the Mojave Desert tortoise in California and Nevada and Utah, and that's federally listed as threatened. This now, this year, just this year, the Sonoran Desert tortoise has been given full species status because it's enough different from the Mojave tortoise. It's different genetically, morphologically, and ecologically. It's different shape, and it has different habitats, and the genetics are different. But it, uh, it has now been found by the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's enough information to say that listing is warranted, but it's precluded because there are other species on the list that are in more dire straits. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, what's eating the grapes? Is that you or is that the uh, tortoises? The grapes that you have? Oh, the gro oh. <laughs> 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 Well, actually, the grapes were for me, but, but look at... This is Bruiser, and he's eating some lettuce. That's not native food, but I also have, this is a globe mallow, one of their favorite species of plants in the wild. I'm going to put that in there, and he might have that blossom for dessert. And there's another vine in there called Desert Vine. Those are some of their favorite foods in the wild. And we call him Bruiser because he just, he, he eats so readily. And he's had so much to eat today, he probably wouldn't be thirsty, but we could, I could put water on this saucer and he can drink off the flat surface. Wow. And if you look at their nose, you can see that the very front of the nose is kind of flattened. They can put that flat nose down almost on the flat surface and they suck water up through their nose, so they drink through their nostrils. And uh, it's uh, actually one of the ways that we rehydrate tortoises in the wild when we're measuring them and uh, we can tell they're lightweight, they need some water. We just use a syringe with no needle on it and with water and we put it up to their nose and they, even a wild tortoise that's afraid of being picked up will drink water from your syringe while fresh caught. They take the opportunity, right? Yes. They, they, and then lastly, some snakes. You've got uh, non-venomous snakes here? These are non-venomous snakes. This is a, uh, a common king snake, and this is one, uh, this is one of the, the snake species that kills and eats rattlesnakes. They're, kills and eats rattlesnakes. They're highly resistant to rattlesnake venom, and uh, <laughs> my kids, of course, they had a kind of a strange upbringing because they lived with a herpetologist. We would go out and find baby rattlesnakes on the road, and I had a large king snake, and we, that's what we would feed the king snake. And the rattlesnakes, if you were to, a human was to go up to a rattlesnake, it would coil up and strike and rattle at you. 
they offer none of that defensive uh, repertoire to the king snake. They just lunge and try and get their head away. They know, they know. that right. if the king snake gets hold of them, it will constrict them and then swallow them. That's amazing. So yeah. you could say this is almost the top predator of the reptile world. What's that? The top predator of the reptile world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it, there are actually several snake species that do that. And this other one is actually is uh, this has then been the most popular uh, snake today because it's one the kids could handle. And this is this is a night snake, and you can see its ragged clothes. This is not because it's homeless; it's because it. Uh, Basically, as, rep as lizards and snakes grow, they outgrow their old skin, and so they have to shed it with a larger skin. And this one, when we put it in the back in the water bowl tonight, the water will help get all that loose skin off. And, and they, by Sunday, or probably Sunday night, it will have a brand new set of, a shiny set of suit of clothes. This one, if you, if we can see the, the, the eye, it is, uh, you can see it's got an elliptical pupil much like a cat eye. And that's, a, that's always a sign that that animal is probably nocturnal. And, and it, interestingly enough, this common name for this snake is the night snake. And, and sure enough, they are found over most of the state of Arizona, but not many people have seen them because you have to go out at night right. to run into them. But these are very easy to keep. This is an adult-sized snake, so it's not a large species, and they, they're lizard eaters. And this thing has eat about one lizard a month, and that's it's a, they're very easy to keep, and, uh, and the kids have loved this one. I saw a coach whip yesterday. Can you tell me about that snake? Oh, ah, now the coach whip it was right here, by the way, next to the snake. Oh, yeah. Stink. See, the coach whip is the king snake is a rattlesnake eater. So is the coach whip. But the coach whip doesn't constrict, and so it has to just kind of push the snake down to kind of kill it. And there are a lot of myths about constrictors, and some of the movies about pythons crushing the bones of their prey. Well, that's not true. They can't do that, but they do apply enough pressure so that the animal that's caught never can inhale again. And we used to think, well, maybe they would just suffocate them. But some studies in the last decade or so have shown that they do exert enough pressure to cause cardiac arrest. So that's actually, so if they're trying to kill something, they don't have to wait till it dies from oxygen life. So just lastly, what does the U.S. Geological Survey do with regard to study of snakes? Why is that a USGS program? Oh, well, or Red Talk, that's a question say. I get a lot. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the Biological Resources Division, and that, that's we're the, the new branch. We were created in the uh, about in the late 1990s. You may have uh, under under Clint, Clinton's. Uh, Midterm elections, there was a, an outcry from one political side to get rid of the National Biological Survey, and that was where all, most of our Department of Interior scientists were. So they moved us all into the USGS as a separate arm of USGS. So now, actually, within USGS, they can do, have the capability of doing all this interdisciplinary science because they've already, you know, they got a water resources division, but then they do, a, you know, a lot of important uh, monitoring of water gauges on rivers and rainfall and that sort of thing. And then the geology, of course, they uh, have uh, always been working on minerals and, and other aspects there. And mapping, of course, the USGS maps are famous. And so the biological resources division is kind of just, it makes it almost ecologically whole, so to speak. Right.